All right. Um, thanks for joining the Make Guitar podcast. It is the 24th of April as we're recording this. Um, and uh, yeah, today we're going to talk about, uh, um, well, I'll, I'll save that for, for post introductions. How are you doing, Mitch? I'm doing okay, Kirk. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Doing pretty well. Um, I wasn't entirely successful in getting my my projects done, but uh, you know, I, I I made a run at it. Well, it sounded like you made some progress, so I think like that's good, right? That's you know, you just have some debugging to do, and that's like part of the pedal building process. Right, right, and actually, I think that's a good learning experience as well. Um, like just the kind of like the little troubleshooting that um, that you showed me is um, probably a good um, entrance into troubleshooting pedals. Yeah, yeah, and then on top of that, like when you learn to do the troubleshooting, like in the things that you check, you incorporate that into your building process. You know, as right. you build, you're like, oh, I have to make sure this goes in the right place because it won't work. I'll have to troubleshoot it later. <laughs> You know, so like it'll it'll improve your whole process. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I also think that some of the mistakes that I, that I may have made might be one-time mistakes, where you know, it's like once you kind of learn how to wire up a a, um, a power jack, then that sticks with you for the next project. I've done it before, but you know, like I was completely doing this based on the documentation or lack of documentation that came with this. Uh, this kit. I don't remember who makes the kit, but it was sold through AliExpress and they have a wide variety of different kits. I think they're all made by the same manufacturer, but they're very similar looking, you know, maybe with different numbers of parts and things. Nice. I feel like that's a good starting place as a kit like that, like a cheap kit. Mm -hmm. I think like maybe you you're kind of jumping ahead. I might start with an easier one, fewer parts. Like the delay kind of has a lot of parts in it and there's some some like weird parts like the voltage regulator, you know? Mm -hmm. But otherwise, like I think that's still like a good starting place, you know? Absolutely. I mean, you, um, I think one of the things that, well, we talked about this the other day and we're going to talk about it today is um, how to convert units when you're um, looking at a, a you know, build materials and then your build diagram, like how do I decide which, which capacitor to use? Um, that's oh, yeah, one of those things talk. that you. Yeah. Let's talk about the capacitors, right. And the values because resistors, like I find them hard to read just because mm -hmm. the colors are so small and it's hard to tell which direction, you know, but and a lot of the colors look alike. Yeah. But, but usually what I'm doing is I'm pulling one out of a bag and the bag has a label on it. So I don't have any problem getting the resistors or I measure it. You know, if mm -hmm. I just find one on the desk, I measure it. It's not a big deal. Capacitors on the other hand are harder to identify because the numbering system on there is kind of kooky, but you can read the numbers. So it's actually easier to read than the resistor. It's just harder to grok. Right. Yeah. And in a lot of cases where something like parenthetical information, like it would say, um, like there's one quantity one of a 0 0.001 UF, but then afterwards it would say 102. And so there's a, all of the capacitors in this kit came with a little label, you know, it would, it would be printed in tiny, tiny numbers on the actual um, body of the capacitor. Um, so a lot of times that was helpful. Um, then in some cases they didn't really match up. Um, yeah. Hey, let me share my screen, right? Great. Okay. So I'm going to get, I have some pictures of some capacitors here, right? Okay. So here's a bunch of capacitors. These right here, these weird looking ones that with a knob, this is like, this, this is like an adjustable capacitor. Oh, cool. Right. But we'll ignore those. But these are the kind that you're going to see every day. So they're always like, well, not always, but they're mostly three numbers. Right. So like you can see all these down here, they all have like three numbers, like five, six, one, two, mm -hmm. two, four, one, oh, three, one, five, one. OK. Whenever you read them, you always read them as the first two numbers are the value. And the second number is a multiplier. It's how many zeros. 
So for example, like if I see this one right here and it says 103, that's 10 and three zeros. So it's like 10,000 picofarads. Okay. Yeah. The K kind of seems like thousands, but it's not. The K is is a, a a letter that says what the like what the I don't know what what you call it like the the variation like like so some capacitors are more accurate it's like the accuracy so like capacitors could be like ten percent off of the given value or twenty percent off right oh, okay I, so J is one of those things as well yeah exactly right okay okay so so what's this one it's like it's like 10,000 picofarads. Like, what's this guy right here? That's 150 picofarads, right? Exactly, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was one of those things that, that really stumped me on this because I was looking for something that ended with a one or whatever, and it's like, uh, it just ends with a zero on the page. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this one, what's this guy right here? 224. Uh, oh, 24,000. Or no, 240,000. 220,000. Oh, sorry. I, I yeah. Yeah, because the four is the zeros, right? Right. Okay, cool. And then this one, five six one. What's that guy? That's five hundred and sixty. Yeah. Right. Okay. So now, do you see these two small or these three small ones right here? The yellow ones, the kind of orangey yellow. Mm hmm. Okay. Those just have two numbers. Whenever they have two numbers, that's the value. It's like zero, no zeros. So yeah. that's like ten picofarads, seven picofarads, fifteen picofarads. Done. Yeah. OK, so so now we have the problem of oh, actually, one more thing. So a lot of capacitors like these big ones, like these these electrolytic capacitors, they'll just say on them what the value is. So this says like 22 and then the UF means microfarads. So that's 22 because it just says 22. This is 4.7 microfarads, 47 microfarads. 470, right? This is 4,700 microfarads, right? This is 100 microfarads, right? It just has the number like right on it. Yeah, because right? there's enough real estate. Yeah, exactly, right? And these other ones, like they have a second number, like this 500 V is like the voltage rating. Mm -hmm. So this is like 100 volts. This one's rated at 500 volts, right? So that's what that other number is, right? But always look for the number. It's like 103, 561, 224, 222, 391. You know, it'll be something like that. And the first two no numbers are the, the value. The second number is how many zeros, right? Yeah, so that was that was really helpful. I mean, I'd never known that before. And, you know, when, when you start off with a bag of parts provided by a kit, um, I mean, you have a head start, but you still have to, you know, figure out which parts to pull out for the for the board yeah and, the, and they'll put like different parts in there sometimes so maybe on their parts list they listed one value or one same value but a different numbering and then on the actual part the numbers look different right so yes so the, the key there is like you said the board or the the parts list says um like 0 0.001 microfarads Yeah. Right. So the way that that works is you got to go from microfarads to nanofarads. That would be an N. So if you have something that's 0 0.001 microfarads, if you move the decimal place three, you multiply by a thousand and move it over three places, then it becomes nanofarad. So that's like, you know, one nanofarad. Right. Yeah. That also was hugely helpful for me. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then and then if you want to go to picofarads, you'd move it over three more spaces. So that's like a thousand picofarads is one nanofarad is 0 0.001 microfarads. Right. Yeah, I kind of feel like this is the kind of stuff I should have like on a cheat sheet, you know, just like um, you know, what UF stands for and things like that. Yeah, yeah. If you were a young person, you'd have a you'd have an app on your phone. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there probably is an app on the phone. I'm just kidding. You know, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You write it down in your notebook, man. You know, that's what I did. I think I have like, I probably have a page when I first started this where I just wrote that down. I was like, I'll never remember this. I... <laughs> well, you and nano just don't really, you know, it doesn't really um, make you think of that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that, that was pretty good.
Hey, so so you're working on that um, on that delay. So you're still working on. It. You're almost done though. I think. Yeah, I think, I, I think I have some oh. issues with the uh, the power jack, and I think that was the reason that I wasn't getting the the light going on. But bypass works. So, um, and then you showed me some things about how to um, how to use the multimeter to um, determine where the problem is. Yeah, cool. Yeah, use your multimeter. Like I have mine right here. Multimeter. This, yeah. this is a great tool. Oh yeah, mine's, I left mine on. Whoops. Uh oh. I got mine from Radio Shack. See, so it says Radio Shack on the back. Oh, that's great. This cost classic. Like, this cost like eighty bucks from Radio Shack when I bought it. Bought it. It was super expensive. And then it's I mean, kind of just looks junk now, but like because nowadays they make all these cool ones that are super cheap. <laughs> it's like all electronics are like high quality and cheap these days you know well yeah i mean like like this thing the multifunction tester this is really cheap um but invaluable and um oh my god yeah. i got mine right here this is the greatest you know you gotta have both though right right because the multifunction tester will test transistors and diodes but it won't check continuity or voltage or current right but the multimeter right. does that right so you know the multifunction tester tests capacitors too. My my, um, my multimeter has a capacitor tester, but it's kind of hard to use. It actually works fine if the leads are long, but if the leads are short, they don't quite go down in here deep enough to work. Mm. You know, kind of a design flaw. Right. You know, I actually put the um, uh, the potentiometers from this kit onto my multifunction tester, and it it re read them as. I don't know, like a diode or something like that. And then I turned the, you know, the volume of the, the pot up and then tested it again. And it came up with a different value. And I was like, Oh, that's really cool. You can actually, you know, get the, the value of the potentiometer because I had one that didn't have any typing, didn't have a, a value on it. Um, yeah. But this of course doesn't tell you like what the, the curve is of the pot. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't think it really tests the pots, though. You can test the resistance. I don't have right. A that's that's what it was doing. Yeah, I don't have a pot on handy right here, but if you test the two outer lugs, this is like a tiny little pot, but like if you test the two outside lugs, like these two, that'll tell you what the value of the pot is. Oh, okay. Right. With so your multimeter. Good. Always good to know. Right. You know. And another thing I learned um, is <laughs> when you have things like these uh, little tiny pots with the little skinny legs and you're connecting wires to them, you need to have, it's like, I don't know if you can see this, but I just, I was soldering wires to these little legs. They don't have lugs with holes in them or anything. So I found if I took the three wires that were going to be connected to it and clamp them with this and then I could rest this against the pot and you know the the legs of the pot and um, it's still a little tricky but um, but it's better than nothing yeah it's kind of these like little a, clips are great it's kind of like a third hand you know like one of those little third yeah. hand tools with like the alligator clips super useful right. right yeah sometimes I just make that kind of stuff up just with the junk on my desk you know like I'll just like put some things that like okay i'll wedge this between two things you know i use the like oftentimes i'll put something down in the hole mm -hmm. here facing up and then, and then i can solder it and it'll stay in one place you know yeah that's great if you have like a switch mounted to a board or something like that yeah right yeah the back of the board yeah right yeah yeah hey so i was working on this uh this new project this week this is my is the bob tavia right it's an octave pedal and I built it a long time ago. This is the original one that I built probably like in 2003 or something, right? And I remember it sounded okay, but I hadn't played it for a while. Let me show you a couple pictures, right? So, so I, um, this is my new one on the right side and then the old ones on the left, right? And then this is what the old one looked like. Like I just took a piece of perf board and I just wired everything on there, right? Um, in the in the old days you used to be able to get all of these parts at radio shack so this lm386 they sold it at radio shack and this little audio transformer they sold at radio shack amazing 
this is my new build, right? So like I made a circuit board, I soldered everything in the board. It's all kind of wired nicely. <laughs> it looks a lot better, right? Um, what I did here to keep the jacks square to the board is I drilled the box. And since it's symmetrical, like I put the board in backwards, so it was facing out and then I soldered the lugs. So I, I put the nuts on this side so that it the, the switch and the pots were like square to the box. Very good. Right? So that just made for a nice build. Here's a close up mm -hmm. of that transformer, right? And then what I did is I got one of these little ribbon cables with like four leads on it. And I soldered it to the to the um, to the the connection here on the board. I arranged the board to work this way, right? So I put all the leads in a in a in the correct order, and then I aligned them with the switch, right? So here's the here's like a little switch that'll go on to the on the stomp switch right here, right? Are those little boards? Are those a product of uh, Love My Switches? Yeah, yeah, he makes those, right? Okay. I bought a few of these a long time ago and I wasn't using them and now I'm using them and I'm like, why wasn't I using these earlier? Cause they make life a lot easier. But like you could see, all I had to do here is once I wired everything outside the box like this, then what I did is I just put it all into the box like this. And then I just put this board over the switch lugs and soldered the nine connections. Right. And then I just had to do minimal wiring here, like a, this is for the input or the output jack, the input jack, and then the two ground connections. Like I connected, you could connect the ground here to the little board, but I connected it to the to the PCB because I, I put the ground connections on the PCB, right? This little board has a, a resistor and a little connection for the LED. So you can wire the LED to the board, but I put the LED on my board, right? So like if you look, over here, the LED is between the two pots, mm -hmm. so it's it's like it's like right here on the board, you know. So it's kind of mounted directly to the board. Um, so I didn't use this, so I just put a little wire across these two connections, and then it works. So I could Got put it. the LED okay. here and the resistor, but instead I have a resistor right here on the board, and the LED is on the board. So I just wired this with a with a jumper. Okay, so you need to jump it. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you could do the same thing. If I if I put the resistor and the LED here, I could put a jumper here and here on the main PCB, right? So so anyway, so the Bob Tavia, it uses a um, I got the circuit diagram here. It looks like this, right? It uses this LM386. So it's like a very simple amplifier. It's kind of simpler even than a regular op amp. So it self biases. You don't have to put a bias voltage on the input. You just like put audio into this input and it amplifies it times 20 coming through the output, right? Great. When I tested mine, the um, the signal was very weak. Like it didn't sound very strong. It was like, it was super quiet. And then if you played like a loud note or you hit a note on the low E string, there was enough input here where all of a sudden the, the volume just jumped. Like it was really loud all of a sudden. And, that, and it sounded at that point like what it should sound like or what I picture it would sound like, right? And I think what's happening is the signal goes through this transformer and then it comes out of the two sides of the transformer on the other side, right? There's a coil here and a second coil, right? It comes out of the second coil, but it has to, the signal has to get over the voltage, um, the forward voltage of these two diodes in series. So these are silicon diodes. So the forward voltage is 0.7 for each one. So the signal has to be like 1.4 volts to get over this. So what I think was happening with the gain of 20, there wasn't enough output to overcome the forward voltage here. So it was quiet unless you hit a loud note, you know? Hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I wonder if did Bob Starr just like, did he play with really heavy strings or <laughs> <laughs> he played, bass. He played the, a bass through it? Active. <laughs> active base, right? Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. But you know what I did is I experimented. I put a booster in front of this, like, and I took my booster and I just cranked it all the way up. And then all of a sudden it was sounding pretty good. I was like, oh yeah, now I'm getting a lot of octave, you know? I put the tube screamer up and turned the volume all the way up, right? And it was like, oh great. So as long as I had a hot signal coming in, then it was good. So what I did though is like the, uh, 
these this pin one and eight, like the default configuration is what we're seeing here for the 386. But if you jump pins one and eight, the gain jumps up to 200. So in the default configuration, the gain is 20. But if you jump this pin one and eight, it, it goes to 200. Okay. And so you don't have any of the problems with the, the low volume on... Um... Oh, well, good, good question. So what I did is I experimented. I tried that, right? I ran a jumper across pins one and eight on my circuit board. I had to take the, the thing apart and I just soldered this little wire in there. And then I tested it. And then it was like the octave fuzz. It just sounded like total octave fuzz. It was sounding pretty good. So that was good. And then I noticed actually on my old version of this, I actually had done the same thing. <laughs> this little U-shaped red wire that's jumping pins one and eight on the original, but it's on the back side of the board. So I must have done it afterwards, like after the fact. You know, that's pretty interesting. You figured it out, you know, twice independently. You know, your old self and your new self figured that same same problem out. Yeah, yeah, it was a little bit of a time capsule. Yeah. You know, but anyway, so I I did that, and then I I'm gonna give this proposal here. Um, I think the next version of this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that gain control on the input because I think that just lowers the impedance, makes it a, gives it kind of a low impedance input, which is not good. We want like a high impedance input for guitar pickups, right? Right, so we don't lose right. any highs, even though it doesn't matter. It's just total fuzz, right? But so I took the I took the pot off the input here, and then I I you notice I have pin one and eight jumped, and then I have this pot and this capacitor here. So this is the gain control from the smash drive. So this like lets us go from like twenty to two hundred with the gain control, right? And then I think another mod might be to remove one of the one pair of these diodes. So like just have one diode on each side. Yeah, yeah. I I I'm not sure why you'd have. Uh, a pair of diodes on each side, but, um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't yeah. know, but that's the way it was originally. I just did it like the original one. Hey, so here's another thought. So the technology of the, or the, the, I'm not super great at the engineering, but just a little side note, that's kind of interesting. And you can maybe incorporate this into pedals that you make, right? The signal comes out of the amplifier and it goes through the coil, right? And this creates, there's two coils on this, on this transformer, right? But they're not connected. They're just the wires are kind of next to each other, but they don't mm -hmm. make a, an electrical connection. And what happens is when you have a, an AC signal going through a coil, right? It generates a magnetic field, right? So it's like an electromagnet, you know? Okay. Right. And that if there's an, another coil in that electric field, it begins it like the the field causes a, a flow of electrons in the neighboring coil right so this coil picks up the flow from the electromagnetic field and what happens is the signal comes out the top and an inverted signal comes out the bottom right so if our input signal was a sine wave and it goes through here right so it's ac right we would get a similar signal coming out of the, co the, the coil at the top here, and then the inverted signal at the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. And then the diodes, right? The little arrow right here, the diodes are like one-way streets for electrons. So electrons can go, in my case, they can go left or right, but they can't go backwards. So the arrow points in the direction that they flow, right? So the arrow says they can flow this direction, but the line says they, they have to stop, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens is only half, like the top half of the signal when it's positive or actually when it's over 0.7 volts. So if I was making this more accurate, I'd have to draw I, the cutoff line a little bit higher than the middle point, right? But the signal comes through here and we get this, right? On the bottom one though, we get this, right? So when this one is high over here, this one is low and there's no signal. And when this is low, and this one is high it's high on this side so the combined output is what you're hearing and it looks kind of like this so you can see there's twice as many little bumps right so that's right. kind of like we increased the frequency like times two so that's like an an oct that's what the octave effect comes from but of course like it's not quite a sine wave anymore so it's a little distorted but that's that's why it's like an octave fuzz 
Very interesting. Did, so you created this uh, this visual aid for your your pedal building class. Yeah, you know what I did is I I, I put it on the, on my a blog post. I just described it all here in this blog post, right? You know, and then I went over the build of the Bob Tavia here too. So like this is some pictures of the build, and I kind of talked about the some other information and stuff, right? So you can always it on my site, right? Yeah, yeah. No, your, your site's looking great. Um, uh, I would like to see it like uh, you know, like re revisit the Bob Tavia with the mods that you propose. I think that would be interesting just to um, kind of see how that how that went down. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to do it. I had an idea too. Like instead of doing the gain control, what if I just made the gain control 200 and then just put a volume control on it and made it like just one big knob. <laughs> So that was another idea. I think that would be cool, you know. But I, th I think, um, you know, some people like, uh, you know, a little more granular control, like um, mixing in the amount of octave that you get. Um, I think that's a that's a popular feature that people like. Um, like you mentioned, the parentheses fuzz um, has a uh, a pot for the amount of 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 octave that you have. Um, yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah, it has a lot more parts though, so it's and a lot more knobs and stuff. So you know, it's right. kind of a, a design philosophy or design goals. You know, are you trying to make something simple or are you trying to add lots of features? You know, I mean, as a as a user, I don't really d do a lot of like knob twiddling. Like once I have a pedal on my board, I kind of want it. You know, aside from delay, I just kind of want it to sound like it, like it, like I've set it up to do. And I know they make those little lock, those locking knobs that you can put on your amps and your pedals to make sure that your settings don't change. Um, but it'd be kind of cool if you had pedals that were, you know, you configured them with little jumpers or with little, uh, you know, um, trims, trim knobs in the back. And then you just had something on the front for like effect level or volume or something like that. Oh, yeah. Super cool. Yeah. Hey, did you did you watch? Just let's let's change topics quick, right? Did you watch that um, history of JHS movie? I did. Yeah, yeah. Um, you you sent me two videos of, of from JHS, and I don't know if we want to talk about um, the other one, but the history one was very interesting. Um, it sounded like he was, you know, he was pretty successful. I mean, in a way, like he, he was his pedals were sought after even before he was, you know, like able to feed the family just making pedals. Yeah. It was kind of funny that he, you know, like I, I kind of followed it through it. I think he started by just modding pedals. Mm -hmm. Somehow he turned modding pedals into kind of a small business, like not large, but like he said, he wasn't making a lot of money. Right. But he was making a little bit. Right. And then he started making his own pedals. So he, like basically probably cloning pedals and modifying the, you know, right. So he, so he was cloning like the blues driver or not the blues driver, but the, um, like the, the orange squeezer and some of the other mm. pedals. Right. You know, right. I suspect he cloned a lot of stuff. I mean, everybody cloned stuff. Right. So there's probably like, you know, like, um, a uh, range master clone and, you know, the right breaker you know like you know there's like a bunch of stuff he's probably cloning right you yeah know, well, doing that, right? well totally inventing a pedal is um uh it's kind of easier said than done i mean even like um like death by audio he um he just kind of combines other pedals together into um a new thing yeah that guy actually, he has a good, he has a pretty good business too. There's a, they, JHS did a video on interview with him. We should talk about that one. Oh yeah, we should. I'll watch that. Yeah. But I guess like he started modifying stuff. So that was just his business. And then it sounded like he took a bunch of pedals. Like he just take them like to like the local music store and sell them on consignment. And it sounded like he had a pretty good deal going there where he was just like coming in every week with like five pedals or something. And then they, they would buy five from him or they'd, have sold five you know right yeah where was he what what um what state i forget i think they started in jackson mississippi okay and then they moved to tupelo 
which is I don't know where, and then they went to Kansas. Okay. Right. Right. You know, the, the, you know, what's funny is I used to do a lot of stamping. So he's like, yeah, I got on this thing where I do these stamps. And I was like, I used to do that all the time. <laughs> I thought it was cool. I, you know, the difference between us, though, is our choice of stamps. Like, mm -hmm. like I think I, I don't think he chose any of the stamps that I chose. <laughs> I like. Yeah, to, I mean, it's, there's I, a lot of room for different uh, interpretations, you know, different visual styles. Yeah, well, I went to art school. You could do you, like stamping is like an art form. Like mm -hmm. people do that, you know. I, I think the thing where he 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 beat me though is he made a company logo stamp. Like I don't have a company logo stamp. I should though. <laughs> well, you, you know, you gotta like, uh, I guess like, have a company logo first. There you go. That's my problem. <laughs> You have a company, and then you can have a logo. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, some people do that right away. Like, oh, my, oh yeah. You know, I'm, I, I made a thing. I'm gonna put my logo on it. Yeah. Right. That was. It's. I think it's smart. You know. Like, I, I recommend people do that. You know. Yeah. Then the other thing is, he said he sold a lot of pedals on eBay, but it was before Reverb existed. So I thought, like, wow, right. that's actually kind of cool. Like, I feel like I never sold anything on Reverb. Or I mean, on eBay because I would think like. I don't know. Nobody's going to find it or nobody's going to have heard of my pedal. So I never really bothered selling on, on eBay, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a little curious, like how did he really get motivated to, to, to do that? Maybe he had like kind of a grassroots community of people around him who were like, Hey, can you make one of those for me? Or can you mod my orange squeezer or whatever it was? I, I think you're right. I think like he, um, my my feeling is that he was there at the right time you know how sometimes like you can be kind of on the ground floor or you can be early and then or late and then you're not you know your business maybe isn't as successful right right you know? well i mean part of the reason i asked like where where he was located is if, if he was going to a music store that was selling a lot of pedals to musicians that's great i know you had uh, a music store carrying some of your pedals but I also think that that's one of those places where, you know, like, I don't know how those guys even stay open. They don't, they don't, probably don't sell something every day. Yeah, right. San Francisco is like, um, I mean, there's a lot of musicians, but I think, you know, I, I, I think a lot of them are just kind of like bedroom musicians. Yeah. And of course, people buy stuff on e eBay and Reverb, but um, like actually going to the, the music store like a music store where there's professional musicians that might hear you auditioning your pedals or guitar. Yeah. Plus like there's fewer and fewer music stores in San Francisco, like, you know, hate Ashbury music clothes that mm -hmm. there was that music store on, on Howard street, you know, I forget right. what it was called, you know, but that Me too. one's gone. That one's been gone like 10 years or so, but it was there for like a long time and that one's gone. You know, there was that guy on, um, Oh, Nuke. Panhandle? What? Panhandle? Oh, yeah, Panhandle guy is gone. There was the, there's a guy, Peacock Music, on like Noe Street near Market. Like, okay. Right, you know, that guy, he's gone. He did mostly like acoustic instruments and stuff, but he still had a shop that fixed guitars and sold strings and stuff like that, you know? Okay. Yeah, I don't really pay as much attention to the places that are all acoustic. I know there's one in um, Soma. It might even be called like Soma Guitars. Um but yeah. there's a, a place down there that does uh, uh, carbon fiber guitars, and I think they're kind of like a newer, a newer guitar shop. Kooky. Yeah, there, I haven't yeah. heard of them. Well, maybe there's a new shop at least, but it so sounds like there's one new shop and like three old shops are gone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. There, there used to be a place like way out in like kind of in my neighborhood almost, but it, like in the Richmond in like on like Balboa, there used to be a guitar shop out there. You know, that's gone. Hmm. I never went to that one because it was like so far away. Now I live out here, but like I'm in the sunset too. So I'm actually still not that close to that one, you know? Yeah. You know, there's, there's actually a couple of guitar shops near me. Um, uh, there's, uh, what's it called? North beach music. Um, occasionally I'll go and look at stuff in there. Um, they don't really have a lot, you know, a lot of compelling things. Occasionally they'll have something kind of cool. Um, but they're also kind of a record shop more than they are a guitar shop i was gonna say like they're more of like a pawn shop 
for some instruments that's inside their record store. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like, you know, they're not really a music store. Though, actually, I kind of like that guy's thing. Like, he's kind of got, like, a unique thing. He just kind of sells whatever he just happens to have, and then he's got records, too, you know? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's a cool... Like if you're if you're hanging out in North Beach, it's a cool thing to you know go window shopping at the at the, the North Beach Music Store. There's another guitar store that I have never been in. It's right around the corner from me. Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but it's um. So I live in Chinatown, and it it is kind of like a. It looks like a cheap guitar store. Like that, a lot of stuff had uh, like company logos or something on it it seemed like very like um well they have a few acoustic guitars and and other things that looked like they were kind of like um promotional guitars and uh, i don't know why i just have not um uh, haven't been in but um nothing really caught my eye from the street we should we should go in there one day and check it out yeah, I think that's it. Like, I need backup because some some places you go in, they're like they won't let you out without buying something. <laughs> yeah. They just lock you up. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and then I was thinking about that JHS thing, and he he was saying one of the things he said is he was like, yeah, the money was the hard part. And he's like, yeah, I don't know how I paid. It. I don't know how. Like, I didn't have any idea how much money I had, but I ended up with enough money to pay people every week or every month, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> then he had to hire a business like manager, you know, you know, but, but the other thing that he said too, is he said, like he, at the beginning, he was like, yeah, I'd go down to the music store with five pedals. Mm -hmm. you know? And then he said, when they moved into this garage, they were, they produced like 500 pedals, you know, and then they moved into another spot and they sold like 12,500 pedals. So like, like he went from like five to 500 to 12,000, you know, he kind of, whoop, <laughs> there's kind of a ramp there. And then they said that in the new place, they, they had sold a hundred thousand pedals. Wow. And I was like, oh my freaking God, a hundred thousand pedals. Like you sell a hundred thousand, like that is a lot of pedals. And I'm like, are there enough, are there a hundred thousand guitar players that need pedals you know, like are there a hundred thousand people buying your pedal that, that's crazy you know well i mean that that must have been distribution through something like guitar center because um you know just oh, selling yeah. those independently would be very difficult oh yeah and he's selling them sweetwater like he's probably marketing everywhere you know right right but it's still crazy because like you know those guys are not going to buy units from you unless unless you know someone's buying them from them right you know so it's not like sweetwater is going to say like oh i'll just buy 500 pedals from you and we're only going to sell five you know right i mean the the boutique market is pretty interesting i mean the fact that all of these people who have done this um you know who have who have made the leap into places like guitar center probably started out a lot like jhs it probably you know started out in a place where um, they didn't have the same economic needs that that maybe we do here in in the Bay Area, and then they were able to like kind of ramp up production to the the point where they could be you know represented by Guitar Center or Sweetwater, like you said, or or um, maybe their own website. Yeah, well, I think he did the right thing. Like he he self promotes. And he just kept doing it like he was prolific, like he just kept doing stuff. Right. And then I also think that um, and, and, and then then third, I'd say he jumps in both feet like he's just like, I'm going to do this. You know, he's not like, well, I'll just do this on the side and then I'll get a job like at the diner or whatever. Right. But right. then the last thing is, I think, like he hit a sweet spot when he started doing it. So he would like pedals kind of became a thing like people like it was kind of a niche thing, like not a lot of people were into it or, you know, people had guitar pedals, but it wasn't like a popular thing. Like, you know, nowadays people get guitar pedals, like they get t-shirts, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and so the boutique pedal thing started up and then he was kind of on the, you know, he was on the, on the edge of the wave, like riding the wave of that, you know, and then his business is growing at the same time popularity and pedals is growing. And so like, I think he hit like a timing sweet spot for his company. Yeah. You know, and, well, then, and also then all of his work, right? He's just like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And, 
you know, I'm going to keep doing it and I'm going to, you know, promote myself. And so, you know, it, that all formulated to success, you know? Right. Well, I, I actually think some of his self-promotion is sort of promotion of the industry. Like, um, like he, he'll have shows about, you know, historical pedals, but then, you know, other pedals that I guess are historical also, but, you know, like pedals that are like from recent history and he'll talk about those and, um, and their influence on, on music and things like that. So, uh, I think he's helped drive the, the pedal craze as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think his, his like his content, the quality is very high. Right. right. So it's like good call it quality content and then the, the subject matter fits what he sells so it, it promotes his company even without without being like in your face promotion you know right yeah he, he shows his pedals on the show but then there he talks about other stuff and i think that's the right way i think a lot of companies won't do that you know but they're they're short-sighted you know so if you keep the your whole industry going you know, then that's good for you, you know? So a lot of times people will say like, hey, I'm only gonna mention my product. I'm not gonna mention my competitor. But if you go out there and you say, well, actually, you know, here's what my product does and here's a similar product, but it has some other features. You might want this other one, right? But that's okay because right. it gets people buying stuff that's in your market, right? And the company or that's selling that other pedal, like they sell one of those, they might say, hey, we should get yours in, in shop too because, you know, people might wanna buy that, you know? So that keeps you in business. Right. Well, I mean, you're, you're sharing the love and I think that's, that's what it's all, it all comes down to, the, you know, um, doing everything you do with love, like the things that you do that you would do, no matter whether they were profitable or not. Um, those are the things that, you know, you could just accidentally find yourself having as a career. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think everybody that everybody should have that lecture before they go to college. They're like, okay, yes. you, you might, you know, you're going to college, you might become a lawyer, you might become a, a forestry expert, but you might not, you might do something totally different. Just know that going into college. <laughs> well, I totally. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, a lot of people go into college these days, maybe with the, you know, the, the, um, pressure from their parents to do something that they can make a living at. Um, and then there are some people who are just like, well, I don't really like anything. I like, I like English, you know, I like history or whatever. So they, they do that, but they don't have any idea about what a, you know, what kind of a career they're going to have. Um, I think there's kind of an in-between, like you don't need to spend a lot of money on college to develop a trade or to develop, you know, um, uh, abilities or yeah. skills. There are a lot of like, you know, kind of trade schools or other ways that you can get an education. Yeah, I think just getting an education prepares you for life and then you can do whatever you want to do or whatever appeals to you. You know, and maybe your maybe your tastes change, you know. Hey, let, True. Me, let, me, let me interrupt that for one second and say, like, let's talk about what we're doing this week and practice stuff. So I, I took some of your advice from the practice list. Oh, right on. I tried some playing standing up and I did a couple other things. One of the things I did though is I, I realized like I, I sit down and I just start playing and recording and it's not coming out great. So what I did is I, I started a set list and I just picked out a bunch of songs. And so I play through the songs on my set list to warm up and then it's kind of good practice. And then I learn some new songs, you know? Oh, that's great. Yeah. So I did that this week and that, that was really good for me. So I think I'm going to stick with that. Maybe I'll expand my set list a little bit, you know, I think I have about yeah. six songs on my set list right now. That's good. I should do that. I, I have, I'll be playing some music with, with Dan later on today, but, uh, uh, the only time I really play those songs is when I'm in the practice space and, you know, I should, um, uh, I should definitely do that at home or play other songs. I think, you know, it's like, as long as you're playing songs, then you're putting in the work. Yeah, yeah. I think I did this a while ago, and then I kind of went back to my old ways where I just sat down and noodled, and that was kind of not good. So, so the set list was good for me, you know. Excellent. Hey, so uh, what are you working on this week? Well, I'm gonna finish troubleshooting my um, my uh, digital delay pedal, and then um, I've got this this nagging 
project. I I bought a, a new standby switch for my Gretsch guitar, so I'm gonna figure that out because I just really want that guitar back in the in the arsenal. Um, so I probably have to take the whole, whole wiring harness out again, but like um, I have a pretty good diagram that I drew up a few years ago when I first rewired it. So now I got new pickups in it, so I was going to finish that baby off. How about you? You have new pedal projects that you're working on? Yeah, so um, I got a couple a couple new circuit boards that I'm going to build, and one of them is a is a a tremolo, right? So I'm going to do another mm. tremolo, but this one this tremolo uses a couple transformers. Oh, really? So oh, you're the last three you... projects will all be transformer projects, right? So there is the the boost, the Titan boost, the Bob Tavia, and then this new tremolo, right? So I'm going to try this tremolo out, you know. Um, what is the what does the uh, transformer do in the in the in the tremolo? To be truthful, I I really don't understand how it works. To be honest, I mean I have only the vaguest ideas. It's the weird thing is like in a in a lot of circuits they'll use a FET like a JFET in the same place you might use a tube like a a triode right in mm -hmm. um, in a tube amplifier. Okay. So this circuit is kind of based on like a tube tremolo, but it's made solid state. So imagine like in your Fender amp, you had a tremolo that had a couple transformers and a couple and a triode, right? Like a, you know, AX12, 12 AX7, right? You know, one of those tubes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but what they did here is they used two JFETs in place of the, of the 12 AX7. Right. And then it has these two transformers. I'm not quite sure why the transformers work the way they work, you know, so maybe I'm going to try and analyze it. Not if I can figure anything out, I'll talk about it next week, you know. OK. But anyway, that's my that's my project for this week, you know. Cool. Well, that's exciting. I like that you're on a like a transformer kick. <laughs> yeah, I have a couple other boards to build, too. Like I got this this compressor and some other stuff, too. Um, and I got this other octave fuzz. So I'm, I'm kind of, maybe I'll do the octave fuzz. I'll do the transformer and then I'll do the octave fuzz. So that way it'll kind of tie into the octave pedals, you know? Okay, cool. Well, you know, if I get this, this pedal finished off, I think I might um, take a look at some of your schematics and see what parts I have here. Um, I know I have to buy some parts, but um, I have a lot of parts that, um, you know, might, might actually make a pedal. So. Um, oh, yeah. I have some too. I could give you some, you know, I got a whole bunch. Yeah, this, this is the octave fuzz. I got the board built, but I'm waiting on a couple parts, you know, to finish it off. And it actually has a mix control on it. You asked about okay. that. So, yeah. so this will have that, you know, <clears throat> cool. Did you listen to any good music this week? I listened to a pretty interesting. Um, so my friend, uh, Arturo sent me this, um, link to, it was, um, ceremony by, joy division but it was what he called a big soup mix and so it had a section at the beginning that slowed was slowed down like i don't know 800 percent or whatever that seems to be a popular number and then it had a big section of you know pretty much the straight up song and then it went into a little bit of the chromatics version of ceremony and then um you know did some other kind of speed drops and things like that so it was cool um but that's that aside from that and i listened to some of those radiohead um uh slowed down 800 percent uh mixes as well um yeah i didn't listen to anything else new crazy nice yeah i listened oh, I, I should mention the justin bieber one that is great the, the song uh, you smile um slowed down 800 100 percent it's great yeah, that one's pretty good. Yeah, I listened to a little uh, sleep. <laughs> I don't know oh, why nice. I just sleep on it. I listened to Holy Mountain, I think, is their first album, you know. Um, it's pretty good. It's kind of like I could see why people got into it, but it's kind of like like the recording quality isn't that great, you know. Mm. Like, you know, it's, maybe it's just the time, like when they did it, you know, like it, they just didn't. You know, they didn't have the technologies that we have now. So, like, people are just doing better recording. You mm. know, it's like the drums kind of just don't sound, they sound kind of weak, you know? 
just just the way they're mixed and recorded you know okay i'll have to listen to it yeah i I think i usually go to dope smoker when i listen to sleep yeah maybe that's the one i listened to i forget that might have been it actually you know but it's it's pretty good you know so i listen to that it's kind of good i can see why people like it you know you know it's got great like kind of science sci-fi lyrics you know like our ship explodes you know what is it what does he say he's like our ship our ship explodes our work is done we've left our lives inside the sun (laughs) that's pretty great yeah actually i i I noticed that you wrote lyrics for your song this week i didn't i didn't read them um because i was still working on my own song but uh yeah i wouldn't want to taint your work with my lyrics right (laughs) well you know um i was just gonna say i think like when bands like sleep have the you know like kind of far out they're not writing songs like uh you know they're not trying to like get girls necessarily um they're right. <laughs> you know it's for the fans you know the people who like science fiction and all that it's it's very um it's not it gives you the sense of permission you can write songs about anything sure yeah, I'd say like what's really working for them is they mean it. You know, they just do it like they mean it. They just want a hundred percent, you mm-hmm. know, right? You know, they just did what they feel, what they felt, and that was great. You know, I listen yeah. to. Uh, you know what else I listen to is I listen to Eight. It's by uh, um, by UFO Mamut. They're like mm. an Italian doom metal band. They're pretty good. Like I can see, like actually, you know, like sleep, like is a little more interesting, but UFO Mammut is pretty good. And they do like, I could see where they kind of got a lot of inspiration from sleep, but their production values are really high. I think the two of the guys in the band are designers. So they do like Mm. these great album covers. And then I think that they also bring that designer sense to like the whole production process, you know? So they, they're they're, That album's pretty good. Um, Okay. I'll have to, I'll have to listen to that. I, I've yeah, listened, yeah, listened just good. casually listened to some UFO of my mood, uh, yeah. but they're kind of I I put them like psychedelic doom metal if you really want to like okay. put them in a particular you know particular category. Well, I'm a fan of the psychedelic music. Uh, I usually turn towards the you know like the kind of psychedelic you know like well like the band La Femme they're like psychedelic kind of. Uh, disco and spaghetti western that's kind of like the the vibe they're often going for in their in nice. their songs sounds pretty psychedelic it's cool um yeah check out la femme okay cool i'm hey, actually going to see them this summer awesome yeah it sounds great hey should we call it a day any final I, words um no just uh you know uh thanks for for watching as always and um you know it's like if you if you have any projects that you're working on and you want us to um you know explore that realm um leave it in the comments um otherwise we'll just see you next week later